Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, everyone. Can everybody hear me? Good. Okay. Um, a couple of housekeeping announcements before we get started. Please keep yourself muted unless you're contributing to the discussion. And please uh, raise your hand uh, with the tool, the, the reactions tool if you want to speak and also lower it when you're done. Okay, thank you. So Hare Krishna, Vanchakalpa Thirvishya, Kripa Sindhu Veiva Cha, Padita Nam Bhavane Bhyo, Vaishnava Bhyo Namo Namaha. All glories to Shola Prabhupada. I'm Majiriya Leela Devi Dasi. Uh, today's program is sponsored by the Alatra End of Life team. Welcome to our discussion on suicide, which is considered a dirty word mirrored in judgment shame and taboo. It is often whispered, denied, or avoided altogether. Given the staggering statistics, isn't it time we, uh, isn't it time that we take suicide out of the closet and bring it into the light? Isn't it time that we have a conversation so that we can help one another and find solutions to help alleviate the enormous amount of pain circling our planet? and sad to say in our ISKCON movement. The first step is to understand suicide. This helps us make sense of the unknown and fear, the tainted and the tabooed. Rambaru Devi Dasi is going to take us on that journey today. Rambaru Prabhu was initiated in 1974 in Cologne, Germany by his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Shal Prabhupada. She spent the next 26 years assisting her husband, Pritu Das, to establish and manage ISKCON temples in Germany, Switzerland, Ireland, and India. During that time, she and her husband had two sons, Madan Mohan, also known as Madi Das, and Nila Madhava, now Sri Madhava Mahotsava Das. In 1999, Rambaru Prabhu returned to college to complete her BA in religious studies then earned two masters, one in divinity and the other in patient counseling. She is a board certified chaplain, crisis counselor and spiritual director. She is certified as a doctorate level educator in clinical pastoral education. In addition, she's also a fourth level healing touch practitioner and a therapeutic harpist. 
In 2010, Ram Barupuru became the director of the St. Camilla Center for Spiritual Care, Urban Interfaith Chaplaincy Program in downtown East Los Angeles. She's been a member of the ISKCON Prison Ministry since 2015. In 2017, she took a leave of absence from her directorship at St. Camillus in LA and moved to the DC area to take care of her elderly parents. Her father died in 2019 at age 92. She's currently caring for her 94 year old mother. Thank you for that very much. <laughs> Over the past four years, she founded Karuna Care Education as an offspring to as an offering to Shil Prabhupada, the goal of serving the ISKCON Vaishnava community by training qualified second initiated devotees as lay ministers or chaplains, equipping them with the tools to work in settings such as hospitals, hospices, prisons, assisted living homes, orphanages, and within ISKCON communities as compassionate caregivers and servants. Currently, Rambaru Prabhu is facilitating several resilience and grief support groups throughout the world, including some personal counseling. Devotees can take a series of three courses on the introduction to compassionate care, which are currently in session. She has a 12 week course to become a certified Karuna care provider. More information on these courses and much more can be found on our website, karunacare.iscon.org. Wow, what an impressive resume and all of it accomplished beginning in your midlife, Ram Barupuru. Today, Ram Barupuru is going to discuss a very important and often neglected topic of suicide. To get the most out of this forum, it'll require your active participation. Please welcome Ram Baru Devi Dasi. Hare Krishna. Um... What I would like to do just first before we really get started is just ask a show of hands. You have a little button there down in the uh, reactions. Just like to see the show of hands of anyone who has uh, known someone who has taken their own life. Let's see how many people have had, have known, just known anybody, a neighbor. Let's see how many hands. That's quite a bit, yeah. Okay, here they come. More hands. Okay, wow. That's a lot. Yeah. What about how many uh, people had a family or a friend they knew who took their own life? Not just somebody who, who was remote, but had a family or a friend. Yeah. Okay. Significant, significant number. And I just I just like to ask just before we get started, what was your initial, just a couple of you, initial thoughts and feelings when you heard that news? Can somebody, and this is just a, you know, random, anybody like to share? What were your first thoughts and feelings when you heard that a family or a friend had taken their own life? Anybody would like to share? Now all your hands are up, so I won't know who's really asking the hand. If you're not interested to share, put that hand down. Uh, Jennifer, tell us what your thoughts and feelings were. You're muted. You're muted. No. Nope. Go ahead. Unmute yourself, Jennifer. She can't seem to. Oh, there you go. Oh, there we go. It wouldn't let me. Sorry. Um, yeah, I remember um, my mind, I was just in shock, like my mind was kind of blank and I just, I, I just remember staring at the wall for what felt like eternity, but it, it was probably like an hour or something. I was just like in, in disbelief, really. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Shock, numb. Someone else. Iskand Nuvrindavan, what was your first thoughts and feelings when you heard that this person had taken their own life? Now they're gone. I don't see them anymore. Can you hear me? New Vrindavan, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, we can hear you. Speak a little uh, louder. Yeah, I, I think it was the same. It was, it was just complete shock and disbelief. Dev just completely devastated. Okay. Did you? Did anybody get any kind of physical reactions, like nausea, or felt really sick in their stomach, heart palpitating, anything? 
Sierra Lila Maya Gorangi, do you have your hand up? Do you want to share? Um, I feel pain and impotence. Um, I feel very nervous and I'm shaking. Okay, so these are real. These are real experiences uh, that you you can imagine uh, that uh, people have. Shama Mai, did you want to share something? You're muted. A uh, Krishna Balaram. Yeah. Okay. Krishna Balaram. Yeah. Yeah. I had this experience that um, with five boys in the family. I'm the oldest, and my second brother joined with me and was initiated on the same day with me, and he took his life. And um, no. I was home on a Saturday uh, evening and my parents were in church and I get a call from the United States that this happened. And I just had to, uh, my reaction was a shock, but I just had to take the whole load of the responsibility uh, of my parents because they're very Catholic and for them, I remember my father on that day just Pacing up and down, my son went to hell. My son went to hell. How could this be, you know? Yeah. And it, it was very difficult. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I want to show you something about, because often people don't really know uh, why people do this. And I hope I can get to this video. We were having a little trouble getting there uh, before. Let's see if I can get, I want to show you a video. Um, and that's not the one I wanted to show. Here it is. And you tell me if you can't hear. Can you turn up the volume, remember? Oh, yeah. Uh oh, it's still going. <laughs> okay, let me just get back to where I need to get. Ah. So, are we sharing this? Can you see this? You can't see this, can you? Uh, I gotta get to the, all right. Can you see that everybody? Can everybody see this slide? No, you're not sharing the no, screen yet. You're not sharing this. Okay, sorry. Okay. 
Oh, there it is. Okay. All right. Can you see that? Yes. All right. So I want to go a little go a little slower through what we just saw there. That was a quick run through the statistics on why people suicide. Now the proper name for in the in the profession we don't say commit suicide because it's like committing a sin, you know, or committing robbery. So the proper way to determine it is person kills themselves or takes their own life or suicided. So that's kind of a expression in the profession we would use. So um, depression, one in three people. Uh, and it's really feeling a deep sense of hopelessness or pain and loss that makes a person unable to see another way to relieve their pain. One in three people uh, take their life this way. Whoops. Uh, mental illness is like one in five. Uh, that would include things like schizophrenia, bipolar, hearing voices that command them to kill themselves, uh, substance use like drugs and alcohol that can make a person suicidal and act impulsively. Uh, one in eight people suicide from that. Uh, relationship breakup, that's a big one. The end of an intimate relationship can uh, impel a person to take their life. Being unemployed. It causes 45,000 suicides yearly. One in 16 people who, who uh, suicide, they do it because they are unemployed. Think of now with COVID, not having employment for so many people. Traumatic experience like childhood sexual abuse, rape, physical abuse, wartime trauma, even many years after a trauma. One in 22 people who suicide for this reason cry for help, not knowing any other way to get help. It's not an attempt to get attention like sometimes we think, one in 26. Debt, feeling pressured to pay what one owes without the money to do it, one in 33 people. Chanaka Pandit says, fire debt and disease. Don't let them go. They can become uh, a huge pressure. Cyberbullying, this is really big now amongst teenagers, being bullied by others through electronic devices, uh, leading to feelings of hopelessness. Uh, this is often for youth a, a reason, one in 37. Financial problems that may seem insurmountable, insurmountable, one in 39. Chronic pain with no hope of relief or suffering, one in 42. Losing a job, it forces the rapid life changes that inspire anger, depression, or feeling unbalanced. Family, what? Focus. What? It's out of focus. Okay, now that it's it's clear again. Oh, the 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 picture wasn't focused. No, but it's clear again now. Okay, family violence—that's a big one. Physical, sexual, psychological, emotional, economic, spiritual, or legal abuse. All family violence is illegal. One in sixty-three. Hopelessness, either long or short term. One in seventy-seven persons uh, kill themselves for that reason. Cancer, patients twice as high as general population, one in 84. Academic failure, low performance in exams and then scolded by your parents, one in 93. Is that uh, out of focus again? Okay. Yeah, I don't know what to do about it. It's, oh, okay. Yeah, I, it's focused for me, but I don't know what to do about, about it. Um, belief you are a burden to others, that's a really big one for elders. Uh, a person who uh, has a chronic or terminal illness and that becomes harder and harder to ask like for a ride to the doctor or to get help for personal care. Uh, this is a real common thing uh, for elders. One in, one, one in 112. Uh, sexual harassment, verbal and physical assault. That's a big one too. Discrimination, being bullied due to physical appearance or race ethnicity, gender, disability, or even sexual orientation. Uh, number 19, a loved one being victimized, having someone who's kidnapped your child uh, or abused them in some way, just being a family member or a loved one can, can uh, make it unbearable. Losing a social position. Uh, it says in Bhagavad Gita, one who has been honored, uh, dishonor is worse than death. Family acceptance, losing social or family acceptance due to perhaps sexual orientation. That's a big one. 
uh, being arrested, the shame and embarrass embarrassment of that may, may be unbearable to someone. Social isolation, losing a friend, a spouse, uh, illness, uh, divorce, physical or mental illness, social anxiety, retirement can make a person really, really isolated. Having a migraine, uh, you wouldn't think someone would kill themselves for that, but that happens. One in about 2,500, it's not enormous, but it's something. Powerful headaches that bring nausea, vomiting, sensitivity to light. They can last four hours or even several days, so that's huge. And then this accidental suicide. And I'm gonna show another little video clip because I, when I was doing research for this, I was, I was actually really surprised. I had never heard of this. And um, when I mentioned it to Materia Leela, she had said that some one of her students, when she was a teacher, died in this way. So for those of you who may not have heard of this, I thought I would show a two minute clip just so you become familiar, especially if you're parents of teenagers. Uh, Prabhu, before you um, share it, click those two boxes at the bottom. Uh oh. Yeah, in the share one, button. Hold a on. A seeking game that can turn Hold deadly. On. Some teen teenagers They're on. are playing They're it. On. And Let it me start over. Be your teenager, our Dr. Jennifer Ash. Okay. Could uh, everybody hear this time? Let's see. I've checked the two boxes. Okay. Okay. No sound. Okay, they're not no getting any sound. Oh, they're not getting any sound? No. So, uh, I don't know what to do. Damayanti, do you know why it would be like that? Why is the sound in your in your side? I see. Oh, I see. Yes. Oh, I see it. Yeah, okay. You have you have to stop sharing and reshare and when the dialog box comes first, you'll see there's a check uh, box down that says that share with now? audio. Can you hear that? No. Can you hear that? No. Yes. Not able to hear it. No, we can hear it. We can hear it. Okay, here it goes. No sound for us. I mean, at least mine, I'm not getting sound. Yeah, no sound for me either. No sound. Rumble up here. They can't if hear. You, you, okay, well, we'll just forget about that right now. You'll have to watch it on your own. Look this up. We'll we'll just forget that. We'll have to just go on. I'm sorry about that because it's a it's a very it's a very very. Um, can you see the PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. So I wanted to share that with you. For those of you who were not familiar, you can go on YouTube and click "Deadly Teen Choking Game." It's a terrible. It's a terrible a trend and. Um, Kids don't, uh, they don't know what they're doing. It's its a kind of a thing where you push, you take your hands and you do it to someone else and you press these carotid arteries and it makes you lose oxygen. And then often people have a stroke. You know, these are kids, 10 years old, 11 years old, and they, uh, they're they just playing and many kids get uh, killed that way. I just wanted to alert people who have children particularly about that. So um, I'll go back to the PowerPoint. So what was what was uh, from this list? What you was, need to share the uh, share your screen. Uh, okay, gosh, this is cumbersome. <laughs> uh, well, I want to talk to you now for a minute. Uh, okay. okay, I wanted to talk to you all a minute. So from this list, it was an enormous list. You had depression first, then mental illness, then you had substance abuse, and you had all these different things like, uh, you know, uh, family violence, being scorned for grades, 
what was new for you? Was there anything on that list of things we just went through that were like, I never heard that before, that people would kill themselves for that reason? Or were they just sort of things you knew already? Were there anything on that list that you didn't know of? Let's talk about that just for a few minutes. The migraine was new for me. I, I didn't realize people could take their lives for that. Yeah, migraine. Yeah, I also was surprised. Other other uh, reflections on what we just heard, all those different reasons why people suicide. Someone wrote accidental suicide is something they haven't heard. Yeah, that was brand new for me too, boy. And if you've got young kids, uh, teenagers, that's something to keep an eye on. Other uh, thoughts? So nobody was really surprised. They were kind of, yeah, I kind of figured people might be mentally ill or they might have a depression or maybe they were overdosing on drugs or something. Uh, look, uh, uh, some of my like uh, uh, a family member being victimized, you know, or um, what was it saying? Um, um, captured or uh, well, somebody's kidnapped, like or being abused. Yeah, kidnapped, yeah. yeah, and just it's just overwhelming to be witness to someone else uh, being abused. Yeah, what else? Any other thoughts before we go on? Okay, let's let's go on then. I will uh, share the screen and we'll go back to the PowerPoint. Uh, okay, so there's a lot of misconceptions, uh, and th there's a lot, but I will go share five anyway of misconceptions about suicide. One myth is that people who talk about suicide won't really do it. The fact is that almost everyone who attempts or completes suicide has given a clue or some warning. So we, we don't want to ignore suicide threats. Uh, someone might be saying something like, you'll be sorry when I'm dead, or I can't see any way out, or no matter how casual or jokingly said, may it, it may indicate a serious suicidal feeling. Uh, another misconception is that Anyone who tries to kill themselves, they must just be crazy. The fact is, uh, most suicidal people are not psychotic or insane. They may be upset or grief-stricken or depressed or just in despair. It's a sign of mental illness, but it's not a sign of psychosis. And uh, often, you know, people just confuse uh, this word mental illness just to throw everything in it. And um, mental illness could be just a temporary moment where you are, are just overwhelmed uh, with depression or despair, but you may not be psychotic, which, like, which could mean hearing voices. Some people who are hearing voices have a psychosis and they could be telling them to kill themselves. That does happen. But most people are just uh, hopeless or helpless. Uh, a myth is if a person is determined to kill themselves, nothing is going to stop them. Uh, that, that was a myth for me too. You know, you feel, feel uh, helpless. You see somebody who's done it. You can't figure out why would you do that? And you just, uh, you just think, well, they were going to do it anyway. The fact is people with suicidal ideations have mixed feelings about ending their life. They don't really want to die. They just want to end their pain. And these feelings don't last forever. But in that moment where it's overwhelming, it feels like it's going to last forever and you don't have a clue what to do. So you just want the pain to end. Uh, one myth is people who suicide are unwilling to seek help. But the fact is that more than half of persons who suicide sought medical help six months before their death and the majority saw a medical professional one month prior to their death. So that was surprising to me. Um, one myth is talking about suicide will give someone the idea to kill themselves. That's a real uh, common misconception. Fact is, the opposite is true. Bringing up the topic of suicide and talking about it openly is the most helpful thing you can do to help. Now, the main cause of suicide, you know, when it comes, when you boil it all down, is feeling trapped 
and unable to cope with a particular situation. You're in a bind. You don't see any way out. You feel helpless and ho hopeless. So it, it, it's like emotional pain or even physical pain that exceeds a person's abilities to cope or coping skills. But it really boils down to feeling helpless to do anything, having no control over it, and just feeling hopeless. Um, people who are contemplating suicide, they might talk about killing themselves, feeling hopeless, having no reason to live, being a burden to others. Uh, elders say this a lot. My mom says this a lot. I don't suspect she will kill herself, but it's it's something on the mind of someone who's who's not very able to care for themselves or be productive. Uh, feeling trapped, unbearable pain, as we said, emotional or physical. Now, some things suicidal people might do before they suicide is act impulsively or recklessly, uh, maybe driving or uh, taking risks. They may drink more alcohol or use more drugs. They might look online for ways to end their lives. Often uh, forensic uh, policemen will go through the computer to see if that was the case, just to determine the cause of death. Isolate themselves from family, friends, and loved ones. They might sleep too much, but also sleep too little. So they could be really hyper or they could just be really groggy. They might say goodbye to other people or give their valued possessions away. They could even become aggressive. People contemplating suicide, they might feel depressed, anxious, uninterested, irritable, humiliated, agitated, enraged, or just tired. So it's really hard to read uh, if someone's close to you because there's such a wide range of different behaviors. So we might be, you know, wanting to know how do we help a suicidal person? And the best thing is to be direct and talk openly and matter of factly about suicide. You know, be willing to listen, allow expressions of feelings, and then accept those feelings uh, without being judgmental. Uh, don't debate whether suicide is right or wrong. That's something we typically do. We want to uh, stop them by moralizing or whether feelings are good or bad. Don't try to, to make a debate about it. Don't lecture on the value of life. I know I'm guilty of that. I have said, oh, why would you want to do that? And life is so precious. Be grateful. It doesn't work. It's not helpful. Get involved. Become available. Show interest and support of a person in, in that moment. And don't dare them to do it. Uh, don't act shocked. Often that happens to you and people are like, oh, you know, this will put distance between you. So if you're acting shocked, then the person will be least likely to trust you and to share. And that makes them also, again, unsafe and isolated. And don't be sworn to secrecy. Sometimes people who express they have suicidal ideation say, well, don't tell anybody. But um, you, you might be colluding with them and that could risk their life. So you want to seek support if you you are, are feeling suspicious that someone may be thinking of taking their life, you want to get some support on board uh, without holding that as a secret. Um, you want to offer hope that alternatives are available, but do not offer glib reassurance uh, that, oh, it's going to be all right tomorrow, you know, go, go take a nap, it'll be better tomorrow. Uh, when a person has gotten to this place, tomorrow they may not be able to even imagine uh, having to endure pain another day. So uh, don't offer glib reassurance. Take action. And that means removing guns or stockpiled pills. You know, in the hospital, I can't tell you how many kids somehow either uh, shoot themselves or shoot each other because the parents have the guns laying around. And uh, that's not a good idea. And uh, having piles of sleeping pills or pain pills uh, available when a person is vulnerable to suicide. Uh, get help from a crisis and a suicide agency. There are lots of them. There's an international hotline. There's a United States hotline. I'm gonna show you the link uh, in a little bit. But uh, call out for help. If you don't know what to do and you, you fear that someone is about to take their life, educate yourself, but reach out to some expert who, who's dealing with this on a daily basis. Um, you want to join a person in their journey of, pa of pain. If they're, if they're willing to talk about what's going on and they trust you, you want to 
Join that journey and accompany them by listening without judging and advising. Just be there and ask how you can help rather than telling them what you think. Sit with them when they're lonely. Often a person who's depressed is just really lonely. They don't, uh, they don't know who they can talk to. They feel isolated. So if you can just accompany them and be that safe person who is a listener, that helps an enormous amount. Help them choose a doctor or a treatment plan. Um, that may be hard for a person who is chronically depressed to do. They may not know where to go. They may not have the energy to go there. Uh, but if you help them brainstorm or even call a few people to see who might be available, that would really help. And stay relaxed and casual rather than getting hyped up and excited and freaking out. It's better to be just relaxed and casual and just invite them to hang on. If you go on online, um, you can actually see little videos of the hot suicide hotline person answering the phone. And uh, it's quite quite interesting to see how they're responding to the person on the other end of the phone, just to get insight of things you might say to a person who is uh, really serious about killing themselves. Um, if they're not ready to talk, but you know they're thinking, just let them know you're here and that you're ready to listen whenever they're ready without pushing them. And that can also push a person over the edge if they're just sort of withdrawn and they don't feel like talking, but you suspect they're, they're making a plan. Just be there and um, let them know you're there for them whenever they want to talk. Um, you can encourage them and give them the information on how to reach out for help. You've got this Home 741741 in USA and Canada. There's also um, there's also a if you go on Google, there's an international hotline on my website. I have a 24/7 hotline crisis hotline, and it will give you the number for India, Australia, Europe, Canada. You know you can find uh, somewhere in the world wherever you are. There's some crisis hotline. Um, now, if you in the audience are you, you are somebody who's actually thinking about ending your life. I'm not suggesting that any of you are, but say if, if you ever are thinking about ending, ending your life, you want to ask uh, for help managing your emotions because it's our emotions that are pushing us thinking, feeling and willing. It's the emotions that add the inspiration to do stuff. You might be thinking about it, having ideations, but until you have emotion behind it, you're you're less likely to actually act. So thinking, feeling, willing, there's kind of a process. So it may well be you have anger issues and you get explosive. And when you get explosive and the, the, the emotions are just raging, there's all kinds of things you may do when your emotions are out of control that you will not do when they're not. So getting some help managing emotions uh, because you're important and the world needs you to be in it. Uh, but when you're feeling suicidal, you may not think you're worthy and worthy of living and uh, you're a burden on some some other people. In fact, the world, I'm useless. Talk to somebody you trust and again, call or text a hotline and talk to a crisis counselor. Um, just little things. Find one thing that brings you joy and do that. If you're feeling so down, music, nature, even a pet animal. Um, scientists say that Animals like cats and cows, they are so grounded and just touching them and hugging or petting a cow. We know this, you know, because if you pet a cow, you feel so, uh, you feel affirmed, you feel like this is a living being and it helps you ground yourself. So that's a really good uh, coping skill. Talk to a therapist who specializes in depression, anxiety and panic. And again, if you feel like you're in danger to yourself, you want to call 911 or go to the nearest hospital emergency room. Um, because if, you're, if you've got like voices who are telling you repeatedly that you need to take your life, and people who have tried to kill themselves say that often there's a voice telling them and, and um, daring them and I don't think you're going to do it and you're a chicken and stuff and so they do it they don't want to but they feel so pressured uh, if you're getting that kind of thought process it's it's the best just to check yourself in an emergency room and just say I'm not safe I'm a danger to myself and in the hospital I work in in LA or when I was in LA 
um, we had a psychiatric uh, unit for people who could just be there and be safe because they were un under surveillance. Um, now, this suicidal urge, it, it, some people call it the darkness before the dawn. It can arise when the gap between our spiritual identity as Satchitananda and our material identity as our earth, water, fire, and air, and ether, and our false ego is so far apart that we can't tolerate it. I mean, we could call it ignorance, you know, that you're so out of touch with your real self that it it's painful. And perhaps some of you know, I know I have had the experience even as a devotee where maybe I've slept too much or I've eaten too much at the Sunday feast and then I've taken a nap and I feel like, I feel like I'm dead when I wake up or I feel grouchy, you know, and uh, life is very painful when you're in that tamasic mental state. So uh, those kind of suicidal urges can come up when we're deeply embedded in the mode of ignorance, tamagun. And as spiritual beings living in this material world, we're marginal energy. So closing this gap between our body and our spiritual essence or who we are as spiritual beings is, is a challenge. And it really requires trying to engage our bodies and our minds and our egos in the service of the Supreme Spirit, Krishna, in order to not be dragged down by our mind which often will eventually take us to suicidal urges. So that's a challenge for devotees is um, striking a balance. I think in the, uh, you know, the clearing stage, we have the offensive stage when we are uh, chanting with offenses and then we have a very long clearing stage. And that clearing stage um, can be, sometimes you feel bliss and sometimes you really don't feel that bliss. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, you might have sometimes uh, wondering, you know, why am I here and have a lot of doubts, which could lead to suicidal ideations. Um, specialists who study, uh, you know, where are they coming from or people who have them will say that these urges, they actually signify there's something in our life that we need to let go of or be free from. They don't mean we need to get rid of our physical bodies, but there's something, maybe a behavior, an attitude, uh, somebody in our life who is perhaps abusing us, uh, it doesn't mean we want, we, we need to kill ourselves, but it might mean we need to let go of something or free ourselves from something worth exploring. Um, they have different levels of intensity, suicide. Uh, if you feel any of those levels, whether it's a little bit or a lot, it, it don't wait to get help. Uh, you definitely want to, uh, take a hold before it gets dire. And uh, this is a link here on the bottom, suicide.org. That's the International Suicide Hotline. It has every country with a suicide hotline you can get a hold of. Um, if you can learn to identify and get help for suicidal urges when they're subtle, you can avoid falling into this pit of despair. You, this is why being aware of your feelings is so important. If you notice, gosh, there's something going on, you know, my mind is uh, presenting these things. It's not a big, heavy suggestion, but it might be some fleeting thoughts. Uh, you want to you wanna take care of that before it gets to be, uh, you know, a deep pit of despair. Sometimes uh, they're intense, and they often travel alongside trapped emotions and traumatic memories. And therefore, it's important to know how to work well with all your other emotions with the support of a counselor or a doctor so you can ground and focus yourself and work well with your boundaries. Uh, most people are not very aware of what an emotion is, even to name it. We say in the English language often, I feel something, but we don't have a feeling word behind it. I feel like a cup of milk today, but we don't know what a cup of milk feels like. That's not really a feeling. So the English language doesn't even accommodate uh, a very large feeling vocabulary. So being able to, to know I'm tired, maybe I need to take a rest rather than overdoing it so much so I'm so burned out that I want to kill myself. So it's really good to pay attention what's coming up in me. If you have suicidal ideations or urges, 
these are some questions you might ask yourself just before you get too far gone. What serious problems in my life or your life is the suicidal urge alerting you to? So when it comes to the place where you're having suicidal ideations, there's obviously something that's out of balance. Uh, and so what is that? What is the problem? Am I not sleeping enough? Am I not eating well? Am I not taking care, nourishing my relationships? Am I too isolated? These are these are good questions. What ideas or behaviors must in now? There may be something, maybe I'm, um, I'm overeating on junk food and the food is really toxic, but I'm addicted to Cheetos or something. And I know that's not good for me and I hate myself when I do it, but I can't stop and I'm, or something. I'm addicted to per, perhaps, uh, uh, people, certain people that aren't good for me. Maybe they're uh, people who take drugs and they're not good for me. And uh, but I, I, um, I can't admit that I need to stop. So that would be a good moment. What ideas or behaviors must in now, or what can I no longer tolerate? You might be in an abusive relationship where someone is verbally, physically, sexually abusing you, and um, you start to think, God, I don't know how to get out of this relationship. I, I don't know how to create a boundary and um, and so that could be an alternative. Well, maybe I'll just kill myself because that's the only way I can see to get out of this relationship. Um, but uh, the good news is if you can get your handle on what the suicidal urge is trying to tell you, it could motivate you to say a final no to a bad situation or a damaging behavior or a troubling person in your life rather than just escaping learning to say no can be so helpful in freeing ourselves from a bad situation or a toxic situation um, suicidal urges often arise at the end of a long struggle it can be the darkness before the dawn you know you're working on something trying to figure out the meaning of life or or understanding krishna in a deeper way or another person or my circumstance and if we hang on, a dawn comes and new, new insights come. And that can be helpful to know, to know that these suicidal urges are really temporary. And people around you, if, if they're aware of that and you're aware of that, it's just about waiting and, and trying to engage in healthy, uplifting activities. But it requires a lot of support um, because suicidal people are not just having a bad day something really serious is going on or trying to come up and and they need support when that's happening um now Prabhupada on suicide I, I felt like some of you would be interested to hear what Prabhupada had to say so i looked a few things up and in a conversation with bob cohen otherwise known as brahma Tirtha in new york in july 4th 1972 Prabhupada says suicide means killing the body untimely our particular body is given to suffer or enjoy for a certain time according to our last fruit of activities. Like a prisoner who escapes from prison, if he is caught, his prison sentence will be extended. Suffering cannot be ended that way. It will continue in the next life. Then in Arlington Street Church in Boston in 1969, a devotee asked, if somebody commits suicide, is that predetermined? And Prabhupada said, no, because you have little independence. It is unnatural to commit suicide. It is unnatural. We have little independence. We can go from natural to unnatural. So be aware of that. Naturally, we cannot violate our destiny. If we do it, then we suffer. But our destiny can be changed by Krishna. Just surrender to me. I will give you protection. And again, on this same conversation, Prabhupada says, uh, guest is asking, so you mean suicide is putting an end to suffering? And Prabhupada says, suffering you cannot end in this way. If you get out of the prison by escaping somehow, it doesn't end your suffering. Because as soon as you are arrested, you are put back in prison again. The law of nature is not so insignificant that simply by suiciding you'll stop suffering. No, you have to accept again a body and suffer. Uh, then in the purport, in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, the story of Chota Haridas, um, that I won't, I'm just going to paraphrase the story. The devotees couldn't find Chota Haridas uh, one day, 
but they could hear him singing and they guessed he must have committed suicide due to his sinful act and he became a ghost. But Surup Damodar, who was with him, said this is a false guess because Chota Haridas had chanted the Hare Krishna mantra his whole life. He served Lord Chaitanya and he lived in a holy place and therefore he must have been liberated. Now, at the, if you read this whole section, I encourage you to go to the Chaitanya Chari Chamita and read this. At the end of the story, after Lord Chaitanya, you know, they go to him, they talk to him. From the indications of Lord Chaitanya's a, a smile and his ambience, everyone concluded that Haridas had attained the shelter of Lord Chaitanya's lotus feet. So sometimes this story is really confused. It actually has a really amazing positive ending that uh, Chota Haridas attained the shelter of Lord Chaitanya's lotus feet. Um, then in Bombay in 1977 on a morning walk, uh, uh, there's a conversation about Vishnu John Swami, who uh, when Prabhupada uh, devotees went to Prabhupada and, uh, and uh, they, they couldn't find Vishnu uh, John Swami, he'd gone missing and it seemed as though he had suicided. There's other places where there's some speculation about how he died. And Prabhupada says, even if he committed suicide, he will be saved because he had lamented or he had a humble heart and he was grave. He'll get another good opportunity to develop Krishna consciousness until he finally reaches Krishna. That's a really positive, that's a really positive note to end on, to know that uh, there's a real difference when a person who is a karmi or a non-devotee, when they take their life, it's a whole different story than when a devotee does it. You know, we have to put them in separate categories, as Prabhupada does. Uh, you know, for a non-devotee or a demon or somebody who's died untimely, they obviously, they have to take birth again. Sometimes they take a ghost body and then they suffer that way. But for a devotee who has chanted and, uh, you know, served Lord Chaitanya, it's a different experience. So I want to stop here a minute. I know that's a lot of information. I tend to give way too much information. I want to talk uh, with you or listen to what you have to say, what thoughts are coming. Maybe you have questions. I can try to answer if I can. Any thoughts? Raise your hand with that button so we have it organized in a way that we can talk. Any thoughts? Yeah, uh, Krishna Pula. Hare Krishna, I just wanted to, I put it in the chat too. So FCC has released a suicide three digit number, it's 988. So you pick up any phone, you don't have to like, I mean, you can still dial it, dial the 1-800 number, but it's it's a shorter version of the same. Great. It's good to have these resources uh, handy. Could, could you could, could you also say who you are, Krishan Prabhu? Um, yeah, my name is, I'm Swarupachitadas, Krishan is my legal name. Um, I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist here at the University of Florida. Great. Um, I deal daily with uh, children who attempt suicide, so. It's my job. Wow, good. Can you tell us something that you something you know what your daily life is when you're on the phone with people? Are you are you listening like do a hotline? Oh no no no! I'm a physician. I work in the. I'm a physician. Okay. I'm a psychiatrist. Okay. So I I see the children that attempt suicide and then come to the psychiatric hospital. So I make okay. the determination and treatment. Okay, and so what are the reasons that some of the children try to suicide that come to you? pretty much covered it earlier i want to repeat it yeah do you have you seen any with the choking game um i haven't here in this part of the country um i mean what i have seen especially with covid is more social isolation because of school closures yeah um so that has been a big thing um primarily it's parental conflict you know if if you don't give the love and attention to our children they're gonna find it elsewhere and maybe even affect it negatively. Yeah. So I, as parents and devotees, I think we have all the more like responsibility to to raise children despite our other demands, including spiritual demands. Huge, yeah. Parents, uh, parents need to spend time with their kids. Shama Kishori, thank you so much for being here. Uh, and I can't remember your devotee name, but <laughs> Kishan Nalupala. Swaru, yeah, thank you. Uh, I thought Shamala Pri, I thought Shamala had something, but hi, I, hi I, Krishna. Yeah, yeah, hi, Ball. I had a quick question. Okay, um, so the part where you were mentioning, um, 
you know, some tips on navigating it. And you mentioned like saying no and getting out of possibly situations that aren't conducive for the person. What about situations where the person can't can't change anything like pain, for instance, like because you had mentioned that as one of the reasons that people commit suicide is just chronic pain and so on. So what do they do in situations where it's not a changeable situation? It's going to continue or progressively get worse. Well, some people stop eating and drinking. And that, that I mean, that's kind of a, a natural way of taking your life, you know, uh, but that that's what some people do. Um, I don't know what you do if you're uh, unbearable pain, you know, you can't find some relief. Most, most people will take medication for that, you know. So, I mean, there's enough like literature and treatments available that will help you tolerate the pain. I mean, you can obviously, I mean, you cannot make the pain go away, but pain is also an individual perception that can be altered. Um, so, you know, when they actually try to study pain, they give the same intensity of pain to different individuals, but everybody's perception is different. So it is still workable. And, you know, there are enough courses that help tolerate pain and build resiliency. That's what we call it. So okay. it's just I think finding the, the right. <coughs> well, let's, but, you know, when you're talking about elders, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking of some devotees who are older, you know, who are who have a really chronic illness and it's getting worse and worse and nobody wants to be a burden. You know, um, and the thought of just being a vegetable who's on medication, <clears throat> because that often happens. You need so much medication to dull the pain that you now can't engage. You're just sleeping all day. <clears throat> Those prospects for some people are worse than death to living in that condition. You know, I saw that when I went, uh, my father was in a nursing home that elders sit, sitting in wheelchairs drooling because they're asleep because they're on those pain medications all day. So I, I can I can imagine that it, it would be even more attractive just to stop eating and drinking and, and get out of your body when it gets that bad, you know. But you're right, there are medications and some people don't want to take them. So I don't know how to raise my hand. So um, this is Sangeeta. Oh, great. I don't see you, but good. But right, there's a little button, a reaction button. If you push that, there's a hands up, then I can see you. Okay. Okay. Can I say something about yep. that? Oh, I, please, please. Yeah, I'm glad you're here. Thank you. 28 years I've been dealing with um, devotees' pain in hospice and non devotees, and I've been in pain for about that long myself. Okay. Yeah. Pain. So um, it is not always um, doable to take away somebody's chronic pain, uh, first of all. And um, second of all, I just want to say that in the seventh canto of the Bhagavatam, Prabhupada says that um, if, if your body does not um, work to perform devotional service any longer, then you can fast to death and um, you don't incur any sinful reaction. So that I used to know the exact text, but I don't have it in front of me right now. So that's something to be mentioned. That's... Um, Everyone should know there's there's no sinful reaction to that. It, and we have had devotees do that in the movement. So um, it, it's rare, but we have had a few. Thank you for that, uh, Sankita. Thank you for that insight. It's great. We have a nurse, palliative care nurse, hospice nurse, and a doctor, a chaplain. You know, that's a whole team. We need a social worker. Then you have the whole hospice team. Thank you. Yoli, I see your hand up. Hi. Um I have a question because I have a daughter who has hurt her. I can't. You. Just want... You're breaking up. Oh, um, how about now? No. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. How about now? Well, I have a daughter who has hurt herself. You know, she's in two. Um, you can't hear me? No, we have a hard time hearing you, probably because some internet is not very, you know, the speed is not very good. So could okay, you I'll, try, I'll come back. No, could you try uh, turning your video off and only having the audio on so maybe we can hear you? Okay. 
just turn the camera off. Now try. Hello? Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Well, yes. okay, great. Um, I have a daughter who has cut herself two times, and she did that recently. And I was wondering, is that a sign of suicide? Because she, she's, I don't know why she's doing that. And I'm, I don't know what to do about that. Because she has a counselor. And I feel like I'm, I, I should be doing more. I, I wish I get some advice on, on what to do. Well, if you have her, if you have her already with a counselor, that's probably the best thing for her, just to have have somebody who's a specialist. Self harm is is the next door neighbor to, to suicide, but it it, uh, it it's not the same exactly. You know why she why she wants to do that. Some people say that the reason why people do that is because uh, they feel numb. They're so out of touch with their feelings that there's a kind of a serotonin that's released when you cut for you have a very short moment where you're feeling uh you're feeling something and the feelings are good but it doesn't last and so people repeatedly cut because it gives a, it the body releases a certain chemical that's as much as i know about that anybody else have some insight we've got some professionals yeah. here yeah thank so, you yeah cutting is you know what we call non-suicidal self-injurious behavior it can occur due to various different things um i mean it can be a precursor to suicide um i think it's an early warning sign you know getting appropriate help is is what i can suggest i mean i cannot tell you what to do um on an open forum like this um but you know we can provide you the resources depending on where you're located if you want to reach out to us can you can you um sure. can you post your uh, do you have a website or somewhere that people on this call might be able to reach out for more resources? Um, I mean, I'm with the University of Florida okay. Department of Psychiatry. I don't know how many on this call are like here in Alachua because I see some other people from other places too. Um, but, you know, any, I think calling the 988 number will probably like give you the local resources. 988. Okay. Write that down. That's a good one. All right. Mm -hmm. So Yoli, you want to you want to consult with somebody? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like besides the counselor. Yeah. Find out. Go ahead. Yeah. I, I mean, if you need more than us, the counselor, they will be able to like refer you to a physician if need be, because um, you know, again, like we don't know what is going on without examining your daughter. So you know, what we say might be very general. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That was Thank helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have a thought, a question? We've got we've got some specialists in the room. This is a good place to ask something I may not be able to answer. Sangeeta, do you are you still having your hand up, or you just don't know how to put it down? No, I just put it down. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a question. This okay. is uh, okay. I didn't put my hand up. Uh, so uh, occasionally. Um, so-called normal persons can have uh, this idea of suicidal ideation and uh, would that be abnormal or is that a, a normal for for any individual in their lifetime to uh, feel that way uh yeah I, I a lot of people there i know a lot of devotees who if you if you ask them have they ever had suicidal ideations they will all say yes a lot of people i know in this movement have had those thoughts. They haven't acted on them. Just because you have suicidal ideations doesn't mean you're going to act on them necessarily. But it could be a little warning sign. It could be something to pay attention to. Yeah, but it doesn't mean you are you have uh, mental illness necessarily. It doesn't mean you have like psychosis. It just means you need to perhaps change something. Sometimes people even take medications that make them feel suicidal. You know, some of the wrong medications can be there. Do you have something else to so say? So National Alliance on Mental Illness um, is a national organization with local chapters mm -hmm. that helps families with mental illness understand more about mental illness and also advocate for you at different levels, mm -hmm. at the state and federal level, so we can have more resources in place. 
So wherever you're located now, it's, I mean, the short form is NAMI, N-A-M-I. Um, we have one devotee, Radha Sylvester, here that, is, that works for NAMI Gainesville. I mean, she's very active in the Kalashua community, doing all, you know, all sorts of different social services. I posted her email there. Um, she does a lot of group classes for families that, lo- that have loud ones suffering with mental illness. Um, she's also an amazing devotee. So um, she said she's watching somehow, but not on the call. Um, NAMI, National Association of Mental Illness. Yeah. Yes. So did I get it correct? Alliance? Yes, okay. National Alliance on Men- Mental Illness. Okay. So this is NAMI is what? NAMI, yes. Okay. All right. I'm just putting it wrong. I will also put this in the uh, comment sections and also include it in the de- descriptions in the YouTube video, which is going live. And that will be recorded. So we can access that later also. Thank you so much. That's a great resource. I'm so glad you all came. Uh, so I can't remember his name, but I'm glad he came. Uh, his name is Swarup Achuta. Swarup Achuta. Yes, and uh, his, his legal name is Kishan Nalapula. He is an MD in University of Florida. Okay, great. So glad he showed up. That's really great. Uh, Sankalpa, I see your hand up. Hare Krishna. Um, so what happens in religious organizations often is that, you know, followers that can't follow all the rules and regulations. And um, so they feel guilty. And uh, I myself, I uh, knew one devotee many years ago. He was not following, he couldn't follow the principles. He had a, what they would call a fall down. And so he killed himself. Um, You know, you think you're just unworthy, you you can't make it. Yeah, it happens, right. Happens, so sad. Anybody want to respond to Sankalpa? It's true, sadly. People feel unworthy and they, in their life. Anybody want to comment? Uh, Was that a question or just making a reflection? No, just that was just. Um, yeah, it hap- It definitely happens. And people feel ashamed of themselves because they're not uh, living up to a standard that they uh, feel that they would like to or, or, or should. Any other thoughts about that? A um, <clears throat> couple more hands are up. Yep, Sita. Sita Devi. Um, thank you. Um, thank you so much for. Um, taking my question. Um, I have a question on the opposite end where you feel you could have done something to prevent it and you feel like you missed an opportunity. How do you deal with that? How do you deal with that? Well, that's part of the grief process. And it's a very, it's a very complicated grief when someone has died and you, you feel like you could have done something different. Whether they're a suicide or not, that's often a response when someone dies. What if, what if, even if it hasn't, it's part of the grief process to feel like I could have done something different. Um, maybe, maybe not. I mean, there's just no way to know whether you could have done something different, but it is part of the grief process to feel that way, that uh, when something happens out of your control, you feel very out of control and helpless. And uh, yeah, we do feel guilty. Um, whether it's it's uh, true or not, it's part of our sadness. And it's also being confronted with uh, our the reality that we're not in control we weren't in control. Yeah, anyone want to share an insight about that? Well, that brings up the issue of confidentiality. So, um, when, as a professional or as a friend, um, is it okay to break that confidentiality? Absolutely, yeah, uh, particularly as a professional, if someone is in any uh, risk of harming themselves or someone else, um, then you're a mandated reporter. At least I am as a chaplain. That would certainly be the same for uh, a doctor or, yeah. 
And I would say if you have a friend who is really made a plan to kill themselves and you know about them, then you really are ethically obliged to share that, tell something, do something if you can. Um, anybody else have a thought about that? Krishnangi, I see you there. Did you want to say something about that? Yeah, I was, as a chaplain and a yoga teacher, I had a student who um, had suicidal thoughts and so I actually knew her therapist so I had to get a message to the therapist and then some time later um, she, cause she made we made a, an agreement together that if she had the thoughts she would ring me and so she rang me and she was in great distress and I had to call the police and the ambulance to her place to get the help and then they took her to the mental health unit and she got the support. But yeah, I, I had I was obligated to I couldn't just hold that. Yeah. I think that's part of caring. You know, sometimes the suicidal person is angry at you if you call the police or you do that. But that's tough love in some ways. You have to care. But that that's not really responding to Sita's question. She was just saying, Well, do I feel guilty? But uh yeah. Sometimes you have to you have to uh, report or Madhuri Alila, you were asking about confidentiality. I think when it's self harm or harming somebody else, I think you have to uh, step over that boundary to help them. Yeah. Um, did you have another question, Krishnangi? Your hands up, and I don't know if it's up because you wanted to respond or. Yeah. Anybody else have a thought, a question, coming up, a feeling? You're wondering about something. Mm. I do, but you're not responding. I don't see you. I don't see a hand up. Frank? Oh, yes, Frank, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I live in Florida, and I was in, quite involved with the religious community here. There was a beloved family. The husband killed his children, oh. his wife, and then committed suicide. Oh, gosh. And... Um, my daughter was his babysitter. Oh. I knew him as a personal friend. He was very close with, with people in this. It was a Unitarian Universalist community. That, uh, it, and there were many, uh, to make a long story short, this happened about eight or 10 years ago. And the circumstances, people are still very, very upset and grieving. Yes. about this and it hasn't been adequately dealt with i mean you're talking about you know many many dozens of people so i i uh, i think religious communities as as close as the iscon community is really particularly since you have professionals like yourself should kind of have a game plan <laughs> kind of uh, in back of your mind what sh would we do should something like this happen because we live in a crazy world where guns are so available here in the United States, unfortunately. Yeah. You know, one has to be uh, proactive. Uh, it's, it's, it's very sad, but I think it's very important that we do that. You're absolutely right, you know, to have some game plan. And, um, and uh, we had, we've had several suicides, just single suicides, not, not to the degree that you have described. Yeah. I haven't been involved in any of those, but, uh, you know, what I ha I have done in the recent past is a critical incident uh, debriefing, you know, and, and with the whole community, we need to be in conversation, we need to have ongoing conversation to support ourselves to express ourselves. A and it's a process. It's just not you get over it that quick. It's not like, oh, we have a few debriefings and we're done. It's a it's yeah. a it's a life changer. It's a total life changer for a community and how they see relationships, their whole identity changes, their social, social understandings change. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's huge. It's trauma. And, and it carries and people carry anger for a long time. Why did he do that? Yeah. How did this happen to us on yeah. and on and on? And yeah. it's very strong feelings, you know, very yeah. strong. They need to be talked about, you know, in a systematic way. And um, yeah, this is part of my mission is to try and to 
create some awareness, but also some people who are trained to be able to do that sort of thing in ISKCON because we're growing and we have all the issues that any society has. We have people and uh, we're, we're not all enlightened. We're trying, we're working there, but yeah. I and hear the, you. The, the funny thing is this man's, the perpetrator, the father's mother was a psychiatric social worker. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And I spent I spent time with her afterwards, yeah. and uh, it's uh, unfathomable her grief. Yes, yeah. no, it's true. Yes, thank you, and and it means we need to have systems in place for that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I thought I saw Lodge's hand up. Uh, did you have something you wanted to say, or to someone else? Thank you for that. That's a that's a very good insight. Anybody else? There's a uh, comment. Uh, there's Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, um, I just wanted to ask about how I'm kind of very shocked when a, when a devotee commits suicide. I know it doesn't happen much, but I kind of um, wonder, you know, where, I don't know, maybe it's my faulty thinking, but like where the help was, how could that have been missed? And, you know, and so I was just wondering if you could speak to that for a moment. Yeah, um, it's a big question, you know, how could a devotee do that, you know? And there, uh, and all those lists, you saw that huge list of different reasons. You can't pinpoint it because you're not really in the mind of the, peop the people. But it boils down to generally that a person feels that helpless and hopeless at that moment. They see no other way to relieve pain. You know, whatever it is, whether it's shame or... or or, or uh, physical pain, or maybe they've been embarrassed. Maybe they are in in a, in a uh, had their back to a wall. They can't pay their bills. Uh, I mean, there's so many reasons. There's no way I can can um, can pinpoint it unless you know the person. And even then, you don't know what's in their mind. Um, I I have attended to several suicides in the last four months, four or five months. And, uh, you know, part of the process for me has been asking people who were close to him, did you notice any change behavior before this happened? And some people said, yeah, we kind of noticed he was sort of, the, he or she even were different. There was some, some behavior, some incidents that happened, but we didn't, you know, we didn't take it very seriously. Or I, or I was going to maybe approach them the next day, but I didn't. So we, we often see each other. And, and notice things, but don't really think it's much. You know, it could be somebody has heartburn. You know, they'll be better tomorrow. <laughs> so you don't reach out and you don't want to mind other people's business. That's another thing I've heard people say, well, I, I don't want to be intrusive. If, if someone has a problem or they're feeling bad, I don't want to jump in. That's all of those things prevent us from reaching out. And I think what I'm trying to do here is bring it into a space where we should you know, we should reach out, we should talk about it. And even if it looks like somebody is really struggling to be able to say, um, talk to me, you know, let's sit, let's go for a walk. Let's tell me what's going on. I'm, I'm here to listen and uh, create relationships that are safe enough that people will trust you enough to share their feelings. So that that's all I know, Laja, is that communities can be just wonderful. And they can also be really um, nasty, you know, something you share, it's on Facebook tomorrow. So we have to be aware of how that affects those around us and, and be sensitive to what we say and how our behavior affects other people. Because you don't know how, uh, what the inner world is. They could be super depressed and just being a sm having a smile and saying, so nice to see you will change everything. You know, they may be on their way to killing themselves because you said hello and and gave them a hug they were changed their mind <laughs> you know so that how we how we treat each other is is huge we're really connected i don't know if that helps anybody has another idea this is my immediate response somebody want to respond to laja uh i don't have my hand up but um just i think in general when we see we have seen devotees or other people. We, we have seen them often. Normally you see them all the time. They come to the temple. They're really very much around and suddenly they are not. And, uh -huh. and 
you feel they isolate themselves what's going on and then um i i, I think it's good to ask like um you know i haven't seen you for a long time can i come and visit you yeah uh, it had before it's like too late or before somebody like you know commit suicide like see the symptoms of somebody isolating themselves or yeah, good. That's good. Or call them up. I have missing you. Where have you been? I, how's it going? Or just know if someone loses a job. You know, a lot of people have lost jobs in our movement, you know, and they're struggling and perhaps embarrassed to ask for help. You know, communities should be thinking, oh, this person has lost perhaps a job. This person maybe has lost a family member to COVID. We've had several devotees uh, who had family members who have died. Just know they're in crisis. And so, you know, we, we need to be thinking or being aware of maybe maybe offering support. Just a kind word would be already a lot. Just being aware and sensitive to loss, crisis, and the fragility of the human mind. Yeah. Sangeeta, is, is your hand up or you just don't know how to put it down? No, no, no. I didn't before, but now I do. But now it's up. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> What's up? What's, what do you want to say? I have a comment and then a question. Um, I think that in the movement, if we would increase our confidentiality, mm -hmm. people would be more inclined to reveal their mind to one another. Um, I talk about this in my seminars with Vaishnava's Care, and I, I, I really believe that there's such a lack of confidentiality. You know, like you said, you know, you'll find it on Facebook the next day, and and it it's rampant. It's just rampant in this movement, and. And, you know, I have this um, uh, support, you know, grief support group on Facebook and there's a hundred and 187 devotees on there now that are grieving. And even in there with a closed, supposed to be confidential group, um, they're, they're still hesitant to, they're hesitant to um, reveal their, their loss and grief. And it's sad. It's sad that we've become like this. And yet I go on other grief groups on Facebook and they're just revealing everything. My husband killed himself. Then my son's committed suicide. They're just opening up to one another because they don't have that same fear, you know, but we have this in ISKCON. So we really need to work on that as a society of keeping confidentiality. And then maybe when somebody is considering suicide, they and you go and say, you know, how are you doing? I heard you lost your job, or I hear you, you know, lost your mother to COVID, they will reveal their mind to you, you know, they won't be so afraid. And so that's I just wanted to mention that it's a big issue. Mm -hmm. and, and um I I came on a little late and I apologize for that. So you might have addressed this, but when when somebody leaves a, a note, ex, you know, a letter or some kind of written, you know, why they're doing this, why they committed suicide, um, and then a, a compared to somebody that doesn't leave anything. So there, there's a difference, right? I mean, family and friends, they're totally confused. Like, what happened, you know? So did you address this or can you? For a few minutes, address the difference with those left behind when they have a, something written explaining, you know, maybe giving a clue as to why they committed suicide compared to no clue. Well, I think you've explained it. I mean, when you when you have at least some explanation or that sounds reasonable or something at least left behind, it it, it the, prevents the grief from just or the mind from just imagining. Uh, and it also helps bring closure to that, you know, that, uh, well, it feels like a choice. Maybe they've explained something, uh, it, it, depending on what they've said in that note, I guess it, it makes a difference. But yeah, having some clear idea, just like having a person who has gone missing, you never know if they're dead or somebody who's died in a traumatic event uh, that can make complicated grief and it ma makes it difficult to actually integrate it because you don't have anything to latch on to. Um, yeah. But I suspect you have some other thoughts on that, Sangeeta. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just I'm just thinking, you know, it would, it would make the grief process go a little easier if they had some clues as to why, you know, and then to as opposed to maybe never knowing, you yeah. know, having to guess. Yeah. 
it's yeah. hard to move on you know it's hard to move on because you don't it, the mind can't rest on something but you're absolutely right yeah it, it moves grief into complicated and then it then it's uh it, it's a uh, kind of almost a partial trauma uh working through it you know you need to you can get stuck in that why why you know uh why did this happen like who was it that frank was talking about you know years later people are still uh enraged because the grief has not been really integrated i uh, so wanted to ask frank like did, did they ever find out why this man did this he killed his whole family and then killed himself was there a note did he did he uh, no but uh i could go into the whole story it would take too long but, yeah we don't uh, have time yeah. <laughs> Uh, his, I don't know. You know, generally, his his wife uh, uh, became a lesbian, oh. and that broke his heart. Uh. And uh, and she also ran up tremendous amounts of debt, tremendous amounts of debt that he had no way of uh, of paying off. Mm. That's yeah. two two complications. And I was like with him the day before he committed suicide. And I must say what he did, the the vibe coming from his whole being was so repulsive. It would, I, I will now know, I will now be alerted to that, that to, to suspect something when I feel that again is so unique is the, the depth of his of his uh, depression and anger yeah so you could feel it on the other side of the room it's unbelievable yeah you know, well well really thank you. agitating for a long time yeah you know? thank you I'm aware of the time so we need to move on Krishnangi uh, what was your comment or question yeah. uh it, it was just a comment brief one that sometimes this, it's the opposite you know of change of behavior it may be that they were isolating and depressed and then suddenly they're they're interacting and they're joyful and and they've actually got the plan and now they're relieved that exactly. okay i've got a way out yeah that's true can be really misleading yeah madhuri alila uh, there's a question on that line um this lisa she's asking that when she looks at the Ixcon community plot on suicide uh, that they be, the body would become a ghost that she has a hard time with this um, because it's like a sin or a punishment she says um, she said I feel that you cannot always chant or read the problem away I struggle with this because I would like to think Krishna would forgive and give you the choice circle of people to help you in your next life so is this wrong or does this make me her, uh, me a bad devotee to think that <laughs> to think that that if you suicided that you would become a ghost and that krishna no that uh krishna uh, krishna would like is very forgiving and then in the next life he would give you a circle of people to help you uh, uh with this well, I think that's what you know when you're looking at the Vishnu John Swami and all those quotes from Prabhupada that I provided, they they give you a clear. It's really different if you have been a devotee and you you've taken shelter of Lord Chaitanya uh, and the devotees and the process. Even if you're not a perfect devotee or a pure devotee, um, you know there's a, there's a whole different experience for someone who suicides that way than someone who uh, was not a devotee. So yeah, I think that that's what I understood from the quotes I read about Vishnu John and even Chodra Haridas and all of those, uh, that, that Krishna is so merciful as is Prabhupada that, uh, yeah, I would, I would imagine too, in your next life, you might get a better circumstance. Anybody else I'm inviting anybody else to respond to that. That's as best as I can respond. Rutadva Jaswami, do you have a thought about this? Nothing particular, um, but I would assume that we're in an association of devotees. Obviously, we will in the future. Yeah, yeah. Krishna is kind. Uh, Maturya Leela, is your hand up uh, again, or is it just still up? No, sorry, I put it down. <laughs> okay, we're we're at eight thirty. I tell me what we should do. Do we have more to talk about, or are we done? Does anybody have a thought or something they want to? Share as a takeaway going forward. 
wrapping well, up. Well, I think, uh, no, well, go ahead. I just want to say some. I can't hear you, Sankalpa. You're broken. I think she's frozen. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. I can now, yeah. Okay. So this devotee who thinks if she commits suicide, she, Krishna might provide a nicer circle of devotee friends who will help her over her difficulties. It's, it's very sad to hear that. It makes me very sad because why, can, you know, why can't we help her to find a nice devotee family, a circle of friends who can maybe, you know, be by her side and, and just... Uh, be there for her now in this life. Yeah, why kill, why kill yourself to get some some friends to surround you uh, and you could have them like now? Terrible thought. Yeah. Krishna, is your hand up? No, Lila Sukha. Hi, Krishna Rambaru Prabhu. Can you hear me fine? I can, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so very much for creating this platform and breaking the silence around this very sobering and not often enough talked about topic. Um, serving with ISKCON Child Protection, this is something that um, it, it really touches home on, you know, with a lot of devotees, whether they went through child abuse before they came to the movement or within the movement. Um, and I wanted to highlight something that you said earlier, that being interested in someone and simply asking how are they doing and being personal, it can go so far. Yeah. yeah. Yes, thank you. And it doesn't take much. Right. It's not much. You don't have to do anything. Just smile and say, thinking of you, so nice to see you, or how are you doing? Yeah, easy. Any other thoughts? Well, um, um, thank you uh, so much, uh, Rambaru Prabhu, for this fantastic, well-researched discussion and taking this sensitive topic out of the closet, as uh, Leela Shuka just said. We learned so much from you and realized that there's so much work to be done, not only by our leaders, the leadership in the ISKCON, but also by every devotee to help the members of ISKCON. Uh, we hope you can come back again and speak again for us. Um, if our viewers uh, would like to support Ram Babu Prabhu's work, uh, please consider making a contribution to Karina Care. The links are on uh, the Zoom chat. I just posted them. And in the description of the event on Facebook and YouTube, it can also be done through the Karina Care website, uh, the link which you will see on the last slide. Um, I would like to thank all of you out there on Zoom, Facebook and uh, YouTube for taking your valuable time to tune in. Uh, I'd like to thank Mukya Dasi, our fearless leader in, in Alachua for her continued support. Vaishnavi Dasi, our tech support there and the um, end of life team. And last but not least, Badahari Das for the uh, use of his track of Gangeya Champeo. And uh, you will hear him again just now. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. I went to go for the And here we go. Yavina Aparada Lakshay Kshitas Chakabadi Taranga Madhya Kripa Maita Sadana Prabhada Vinde Namaste Sadana Astakamya Shinaya Pateva Vinda Venadisha Pata to bring her Saprapya Vinda Venadisha
Yeah. Uh-huh. 